Ladies and gentlemen, stick around. We've got Ideas by Elliot. Hey, folks, you're listening to Ideas by Elliot. And we're here with Ideas by Elliot. Podcast, podcast, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> This is the Ideas by Elliot podcast, sponsored by Camera Corner Studios, Yikes Salon, Trisha Now Law, and Release Wire. My dad, Elliot Christensen, is the master of the internet. He makes advanced Drupal websites for people all over the world. This is his chance to take a break and talk in depth with the most interesting people he knows. There are no rules, there's no censor, there are no do overs. It's raw unscripted, and never edited. This is episode number 30. From a secret lair in the basement, he talked with our friend, attorney Trisha Nell, about the August 12, 2016 announcement of the overturning of the conviction of the young man featured in Netflix's Making a Murderer, Brendan Dassey. Now, here's Ellie and Trisha. Hello, Elliot. Wow. Huge news. The short, small response we got, we're doing the podcast literally hours after the decision came out by U.S. Magistrate Judge William Duffin, I believe is how I pronounce his name. Uh, We've gotten tons of comments that just say justice. I think a good majority of the listeners out there and the general public, and this could very well be from making a murderer, We know that there's a lot of people that are fans of that series. I do believe that Brendan Dassey was wrong. I happen to be one of those people, and I was the legal correspondent for WAY. No matter whether I believe that Brendan Dassey was involved in this case or not, as far as the murder, I still will not say that. I believe that he had not been served justice in this legal system, and I believe that he definitely was (laughs) in every step of the process of this illegal process he had been wronged and all i can say is that i was waiting and waiting for this decision to come down it's been pending since 2014 so almost two years it's been in this magistrate's hands oh it's amazing and the one thing i just want to point out right away so people know is what the actual decision means It's a 91-page ruling, but what it means actually is that Brendan Dassey's conviction has actually been overturned. He will be set free in 90 days should the prosecution decide not to retry Mr. Dassey or not to appeal the decision. So in 90 days, Brendan Dassey, at age of 26 years old, could be going home. Now, neither side, neither his own attorneys or um, the Department of Justice's attorneys have made any comment. I think the Department of Justice's attorneys have said at this time they're reviewing the decision. I really hope at this stage of the game that it's time to let this young man now go home. Was that expected? I don't think legally it was expected. I think the general public just felt, yes, it's justice. Of course he should go home. I mean, yes. Oh my gosh, everything has been wrong the whole way. But if you look at it from a legal standpoint, I personally, and I'm not saying this to be any way patting myself on the back, I was expecting this. And that's only for the fact that I have been involved in this for so long and I really, 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 truly believed in the system. And this is a really only the second time that I know of in the Seventh Circuit in a case that I know of that went to the federal court and, I mean, went past the state court of appeals, went past the Supreme Court, and went up to the federal court with a habeas, and a federal court actually overturned a conviction on its own and released a prisoner in this type of a case. And the only other case I can compare it to would be the Monfiles case. And that was Michael Piaskowski. And of the six Monfiles that were tried in Brown County and convicted, all of them went through all the appeals process 
And some of them even went to different federal judges or different federal magistrates. And only Michael Piaskowski had his conviction overturned by a federal judge. And he is free today. It's amazing. You mentioned that it was overturned and justice was served. That really doesn't matter if he was involved or not. Yes, I I don't think it does matter because I believe at every step of the legal process, you still have to follow the law. And these specific facts of this case really are very bright lined. We have an individual here who is 16 years old. We know for, for a fact that his, his competency was, he was a little bit lower of a competency. He was, not, he was not taking general classes at school. Secondly, uh, my gosh, we can get to the fact that he was questioned or interrogated, I should say, numerous times without a parent and without an, his attorney who allowed that to happen. And third, these two individuals who interrogated him, and I am saying this out of respect, are two of the very best interrogators in criminal defense. For instance, Tom Fossbender, he's not just for Manitowoc County or Calumet County. He is an interrogator for the Department of Justice for the state of Wisconsin. Michael Wiegert now is a, is a lieutenant He's also very good. These are highly skilled individuals who, out of some of the best criminals, would confess to things they haven't done with these guys interrogating them. And the problem with the interrogations are the way they went about them. And I have to say, thank you to U.S. Magistrate Judge William Duffin. I think he hit a home run. He went and he said, basically, the state courts got it wrong, the Court of Appeals got it wrong, and the Supreme Court never even looked at it. And by that, he goes into the errors that were made. And it's amazing. He lays out exactly what happened in these in this confession, in the way the interrogation happened. And these are some of the things that we as defense attorneys talk about on a day-to-day basis that happen all the time, but are never, ever brought out. And I just have to give him such high regards in the way he even wrote his ruling. I just want to read one part of something that's really, really important as part of our our constitution is part of what we what we live for is the fact that we have to be able to give voluntary confessions. We have to give voluntary statements. And Judge Duffin says... This judge, he's a magistrate? Yeah, that's a great question, Elliot. In fact, what makes this even more interesting is that in the Seventh Circuit, which is the federal circuit, and we in Green Bay, we have Judge Griesbach, who happens to be the chief judge, but we also have Milwaukee is part of our federal program too. All of our U.S. district judges are appointed by the President of the United States, as well as by the U.S. Senate, and they're actually given lifetime tenure. So it's a pretty big deal to be a U.S. district judge. As far as the U.S. district judge, they have pretty big dockets. I mean, they're, they're busy. We have U.S. magistrates who assist judges on a daily basis. And how they're chosen is the U.S. judges kind of get together and they decide to appoint who these magistrates should be. And what their duties are, are basically they oversee the first appearances of most criminal defendants that come into the federal system. They set the bail for them. And they conduct administrative duties. And what I mean by that is oftentimes they'll do mediations or arbitrations or conduct motion hearings, things of that nature. Those are the basic things I can think of. So they're, they're very helpful on a day-to-day basis. So going back to you asking me about that, I find it just completely amazing that we have a U.S. magistrate who was appointed by the rest of the judges in 2014. He was a business lawyer for 25 years, worked for Godfrey and Kahn. And in 2014, he got this case 
and he got appointed in March or something and got the case in April and has had it since. And so this is an individual who gets one of the highest, I mean, this is a national case, gets this case and he blows it out of the water. It's like not having to be a legal eagle, but yet he is. He makes every legal argument that he can make, but he also uses common sense. And that is what has been, been missing from this from day one. It seems like from sitting in the trial from day one, what is happening here? Everybody just forgot their common sense. That is what I think got people so upset when they started watching Making a Murderer. And they got angry with the system. And I think that's where we end up today, even with the situation we're in with Black Lives, Blue Lives, all of that. It's, it's where's our common sense? I just have to say that's he, he hit it. it doesn't, you don't have to be a criminal defense attorney for 25 years to get what happened here. You don't have to sit on the bench for 30 years to know. Sometimes maybe that's the wrong way to look at it. I think most people, though, especially people that are more on the right wing of politics, they want us to throw the book at criminals. And they would actually prefer that some innocent people get imprisoned than any guilty people be free. Whereas, of course, I feel completely the opposite. Because you said common sense. Well, I'm going to just throw out there that I'm Republican. I do believe that there is a time and a place that people need to be punished. For what they've done but i also believe in second chances and i also believe that you must follow the law before you can convict somebody and right or wrong otherwise we have all kinds of crazy people being convicted of things that they really didn't do and we really don't have a system out there and you'll find that a lot in the drug world and you'll find that a lot in homicides so those are your two biggest I would say, corrupt areas of the law. And I think we need to check ourselves in those areas. The underage thing does bother me. I am wondering why we ever try anyone as an adult, ever, much less when someone like this, he is not only underage, but under IQ'd, underrepresented, I'm so confused as to why people think justice was served prior to this. Okay, first I'm going to start with answering your question about underage. I think it's important to note, because this is something you feel very strongly about, clearly you have a young son and he's a good kid, but at any time in school we have what's called liaison officers. And most kids think that liaison officers are at school to help you, or if something's a matter, you can go talk to them. Kids may not realize that they did something wrong, but they're going to tell the liaison officer because that's your friend or your buddy or the person you tell that to. But really, the liaison officer is still a police officer and is acting as a police officer while they're at the school. Now, let's step back for a minute. In the state of Wisconsin, uh, there has been case law that juveniles as young as the age of 10 years old have been tried as adults. And it, of course, it's for certain crimes. Okay, that's crazy, right? I agree. It's for violent crimes, of course. And how that happens is they have to go through a system where the prosecutor and the defense have to argue to the court whether or not they stay in juvenile court or adult court. You know, a perfect case of that is the Slender Man case we all hear about. Those girls are in adult court. That's nonsense. So if you're a 10-year-old black kid, you're going to be tried as an adult. If you're a 26-year-old white kid, you're in college and you can be on your parents' insurance. That makes me crazy. That makes me crazy also. And that's the criminal defense part in me. If you're 17 years old in the state of Wisconsin, you're automatically charged as an adult. Even if you're in high school, even if it's just a fight, maybe you're on your way to the military the next day. Maybe you didn't start the fight. You may be charged with a felony, and your life is over as of that day. <laughs> what can we do about that? I mean, so this case, this overturning, thats I feel like that's a step in the right direction. But what more can we do? Because that ha to me, that has to change. I am, am, Maybe I'm alone. Maybe I don't understand. 
I agree. And I think that we need our prosecutors and we need the general public to talk to our legislators and we need to start in each state getting a better grip on having some statutes put in place, some bills put in place. Because right now, there's just a lot of case law out there. It's all over the board. People are making these decisions and they're fighting them in court. But I can tell you right now, at the age of 17, you are being tried as an adult. And that is so hurtful. So hurtful for kids. So I can't go buy my own cigarettes. I That's can't, correct. I can't buy a drink. I can't get married without my parents' permission. That's correct. But I can be tried as an adult. And you can go to prison, an adult prison. Why does anyone think that's okay? They think that their kids need to be on their insurance when they're middle-class white kids at college. They think they need to be on their parents' insurance till they're 26 years old. But we have other people who have probably not had the level of privilege, and we throw the book at them at 17 or younger. There are times when that's appropriate, but there are a lot of times when it's not appropriate. And that's the problem I have. So politics aside, we need to do something about this in our state. We cannot let this sit and go by and let some random prosecutors who in each different county want to decide what they want to do with each kid. And maybe they don't like that family. I'm not saying prosecutors generally are biased or, or whatnot, but I'll be honest, everybody has bias. We have judges that have bias, we have police officers that have bias, we have detectives, we have prosecutors, we have municipal people. The fact is if we had something better laid out that was, was fair and honest and just, we wouldn't be in these situations where kids are all over the board and they would know what they were doing. And I want to just step back one more minute and talk about, I hope it's okay if I say Max. So say, for instance, Max is at school, believes in this liaison officer, and he didn't do anything wrong, for instance. He's just at school. And one day, the liaison officer will say, Officer Jackson says, Max, I need to see you in the principal's office today. Can you come on in at 2 o'clock? In comes Max, and it's the principal and it's Officer Jackson, and they bring him in and they sit him somewhere by the door and they say, the door's open, Max, you're free to leave, but we'd like to talk to you. And we heard that there was a gun in your locker and that you brought a gun to school today or that you brought a weapon to school today. And the weapon may have been a pen with a, some sort of, I don't know, wrapped around eraser or whatever, who knows, whatever. And Max sits there and Max, knowing that he has a lawyer and a father, says, Officer Jackson and Principal So-and-so, thank you for asking me these questions. Unfortunately, I choose to have my attorney and my father here before I answer any further questions. That's what Max would do. Most kids would say, well, um, yeah, but, you know, Jacob told me to have it. You know, like, it, it just goes on, and it becomes an, an admission, and then all of a sudden it's a crime, and then it's this, and then it's that. And the truth of the matter is, that individual is allowed to have an attorney there, and they can ask for a parent to be there. Now, we have kids who are 26 years old getting insurance because they're in college. They're getting educated, they are educated. We have uh, potentially 10-year-olds who are in the principal's office getting interrogated by police officers, and it is not automatic that their parents and attorney are called, and no. it's not automatic that when that doesn't happen, it's, that this doesn't get just thrown out. No. And so what you need to do, and I say this over and over, is to tell your children, remember, police are free to approach children and question them at any time about anything if they're involved in a crime. But as an adult, we can't be forced to answer questions and neither can the child. So if the child refuses to answer the question, they may be taken down to the station. They may be put in handcuffs, whatnot. But at some point, they need to tell them they would like their attorney or their parent or both. I always say both because you're really 
you're allotted your right to an attorney if they're really going to say that you're being accused of a crime or being arrested for a crime. And you know what? For those five minutes that it takes to be uncomfortable and have to go through that, it is worth it because police should not should not be interrogating minors without parental permission or without having a lawyer there. What bothers me about this is the interrogators should know better. If you're a 30-year-old man, you know that you don't get to uh, have relations with a 17-year-old girl. There's no question. That's the line. You don't get to do that. That's true. And the way they get around this is they say, well, you're not under arrest. We didn't read them your Miranda rights. You're not under custodial interrogation, meaning you're free to leave. But no kid feels they're free to leave when there's big old Officer Jackson, and then the principal there, it just isn't true. So in all reality, um, it's just important for us to really inform our kids that they need to really be aware of their rights. I think you can't even overstate that. We had on political radar, we had our new police chief, Andrew Smith. He was in uniform and the emotion in the room compared to the, we had, we did two episodes back to back that day. Sure. Just the entire vibe in the room just changed. And not necessarily worse, but there is a level of respect that a uniform just automatically gives. Absolutely. And that brings me to the point, but how Brennan Dassey, clearly, when these individuals, Fassbender and Weger, were interrogating him and telling him, we're on your side, we're behind you, and giving him this false sense of, we're going to give you leniency, we're, you know, if you tell us what we need to know, blah, 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 and This goes on in Judge Duffin's ruling. He says, to be honest with you, they took away his, and I love his words, they took away his voluntariness and they took away, they overbore Dassey's free will by their deceptive interrogation tactics, by making him believe that, as he said, what these guys, you know, these big guys wanted him to say, I'll be okay. In fact, when he thought he was going to be arrested, he's like, well, just be for one night, right? Then when they let him go, they said, well, do you want to go home and take a shower or whatever? And he said, no, I want to go to math class. I mean, this is, this is what we're dealing with. And they think it's okay? No, no, that's not okay. This kid, Brandon Dossi, he had the benefit of exposure on a Netflix series and all this video testimony that was shared with the world. What if you're, you know, and I hate to, I hate, I hate to keep going to the Black Lives Matter things, but, you know, what if you're a, a kid without the benefit of some filmmakers from New York coming to film your case? And you know what? He got lucky because he's a poor kid from Michigan living off a salvage yard who would ever think that he would have gotten this press. So for that He deserves what this opportunity he got. But as you would say, oh my gosh, I think on your political podcast, you bring up such a good point, and I'm afraid to even start that. The amount of black individuals allegedly living in the state of Wisconsin when they're really the prison areas where we have prisons here make it so so horrible so are you alluding to that map that shows that where the pockets of black individuals are that the black neighborhoods in wisconsin those are actually prisons yes and what hurts me and i feel like i i sometimes feel like when i'm doing a sentencing to a judge i am saying the same story and i almost have to watch to make sure that they're not looking at me like are you full of shit so many people have come here from chicago from Iowa, from Minneapolis, have come here to have a better life. They are told to come here to have a better life. Some of them were even come to shelters here. They've had parents OD. They've lived on the streets of Chicago. They lived on the streets of Milwaukee. They lived on the streets in other cities. They had, where they had to steal food for their brothers. Parents on all kinds of drugs. And they came here, and you know what? Life wasn't perfect. And so, yes, maybe they're in the system, but they sure as shit do not belong where they are now and for how long they are now compared to 
if we do a comparison to other individuals that I have that I represent, I just feel like it's an uphill battle. But I certainly sit there and I tell their whole dang story. And I feel like I make a difference when I do that. But it's the same story. It's the same story. And it's the truth. So you think there's a racial difference in the courts? Yes. And that was difficult for me to say. Is it racial or is it income or is it both together, both separately? I want to say one thing, but I believe that if you argue appropriately and give the judges the information and the facts and the tools that they need in a sentencing, that they will give that person, no matter what color, the opportunity. I really do because I have had very good outcomes, purple, blue, black, green, orange, whatever. But is that because you're a good attorney, though? I just think that I work really hard at telling the sto- at telling their story and making sure that I show pictures, bring witnesses in, tell their story, and tell them why they're there that day, why, how they got there. But I also work with the DAs to do that. So I'm not fighting a losing battle. The judge is seeing that we're working together and we have a plan for the person that we're working with. Now, I've been done wrong by fighting for people and then all of a sudden they get out and they turn right around and do the same thing. And I look like a fool. I'll tell you that because I put my my arm out, my leg out a couple times in front of one judge specifically. So it kind of goes both ways, but I, I have to say. What do you think about the three strikes you're out kind of thing? When it comes to sexual assault cases, if it's not two minors being involved, those cases drive me crazy. If they're consensual, I don't even want that to be a sexual predator because you know what? It screws up the whole system. Who is a sexual predator then? You put those people that are on the list so that I know who I'm supposed to be afraid of. Because right now, I got Cousin Eddie who went out with Jill who was a freshman and he was a junior and they were consensual relationship for two years and their parents was okay with it and then all of a sudden they found out oh my gosh it's not legal and now he's a sexual predator for the rest of his life i mean there of course are exceptions but i just no not that but i do believe that if we have real sexual predators out there there definitely needs to be a three strike law because I have gone to seminars for the government even. I've gone to behavioral seminars with the U.S. Marshals. I don't believe that that's something that can be rehabilitated. Why do they get three strikes even then? I don't know that after one, you can say that somebody doesn't deserve a second chance. I don't know that there aren't mistakes of some sort. The justice system to me, I'm not sure ever that one time is there could be have been someone who conceived that their breast was grabbed when another person did not believe there's an it's just too ambiguous. My understanding of the three strikes law is that if you have a felony and then you have another felony and you have a third felony, you're done. And I guess part of the problem I have with that is a felony could be breaking your probation. Is that not accurate? It could be felony bail jumping, correct. I have an issue with both extremes, the Brennan Dassey extreme, the underage extreme, and then the putting people away forever over technicalities. Well, okay. I see that point, but is it a technicality or is it not? Because if you are placed on probation or extended supervision as part of your punishment. And part of it is not to do drugs or be around people who are involved in drugs because your crime was manufacturing drugs and you break that condition of your bond. I'm sorry, you could have been sitting in prison for that other half of the time that you were out. And guess what? 
no matter whether we like drugs or not like drugs in this world, we have to realize that drugs do cause deaths. They cause, unless we're going to legalize them, and I'm not going to start that whole discussion today, but we'll do right, that next time. Yeah. Right now, they cause a lot of havoc. They cause a lot of crime. They cause a lot of burglaries, robberies, murders. Half of the things that our officers deal with are drug related. And me skipping stop signs. You know, Elliot, you're going to be three strike on you running through stoplights. And I don't know what to do about it. I mean, what? We, we just take your license forever? <laughs> Back to Brandon Dassey. This thing is thrown out. Overturned. Overturned. Not thrown out yet. So can you draw some similarities between that? And what happened to Stephen Avery, who's in prison, and he was exonerated, and then he got out, and he may or may not have become a criminal again, and then they threw the book at him. They are two completely different. Two complete, it's apples and oranges. Stephen Avery was exonerated based on DNA evidence, and the ruling was that he was found that he did not commit the crime. In this case... Judge Dufin found that Brandon Dassey's case needed to be overturned based on the fact that his confession could not have been voluntary based upon the leading and suggestive tactics that these investigators used, and therefore the confession could never have been voluntary for one part of it. Secondly, that his lawyer's misconduct was indefensible. Furthermore, that the Court of Appeals missed it at every step, and so did the Supreme Court when they went to review it. And therefore, at this point, this young gentleman should be freed and let go and gone home. And he also mentions that he was given such leading questions and non- Public facts were given to him that, in fact, there was no evidence that could be directly related to him that he committed the murder. So if this thing stays, this will be wiped from his record and he'll be good to go? I don't know that, per se, it won't say wiped from his record. It's not an exoneration, per se. It is saying that the case was overturned and he will, yes, he will be released within 90 days if they decide not to retry him or appeal it. Now, I have questions whether or not that there was new counsel again appointed to Avery's case. I don't know if the Department of Justice is going to be the one handling this case, or if they're going to also have part of the state that's working on Avery's step in. But if anything, I think that they should just walk on this case. And I think everybody knows that. In fact, Ken Kratz will be the first to admit that. He's said that over and over. He said that he believes... About Brendan Dassey. About Brendan Dassey. He believes that Brendan Dassey was a martyr for Stephen Avery, that he was given numerous plea deals where he would already be out today. And unfortunately, that his mother, as well as Stephen Avery's father, would not let him take those plea deals to let him be out free. So I know for a fact that Ken Kratz believes that Brendan Dassey is a victim of the Avery family. I feel like that's a technicality because he did provide confessions and information that usually is in exchange for some softer sentence, and he didn't get that. And... What did his That just makes me feel like there's two justice systems. There's the people that can afford good attorneys and then there's the people who Well, exactly. And if you look at his own attorney, if you look at the investigator, his own investigator, if you watched, his own investigator was thought was working for Ken Kratz, I would have thought. His attorney. And his attorney's investigator. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, I mean, we don't know what happened behind closed doors, but Len says out loud that he was given a plea deal and refused it. 
Ken Kratz says he was given a plea deal and, re- and that Barb Yonda, as well as Stephen Avery's father, forced Brendan Dassey to refuse the plea deal, which would have had him out around this time. We don't know really what happened, I mean, in all reality. But the truth of the matter is that information that was given by Brendan Dassey, according to Duffin's rulings, there's not credible anyway. It was leading questions that were given to him with facts that were fed to him, and there was no credible evidence that ever led him to the murder. So if you look at it that way, and you look at all the other things that he talks about, his age, his IQ, the fact that nobody was there, you really need to take a big look at the whole picture and say, should Brandon Dassey have ever been there in the first place? Maybe that's why they said, we don't want to take a plea deal. Maybe that's why Brendan said, no. Maybe he thought he could go home. He thought he could go home the first night after one night of being arrested. Who knows? We're not dealing with the person that understands this. And maybe truly he thought to himself, I didn't do anything, so I'm not going to say I did. I'm not going to plea. What makes me lose my mind is a 17-year-old girl can't be in charge of what she does with her own body, but this 16-year-old boy can be locked away forever with very shaky evidence that he was even there. Right. And in fact, there was even recantation from the cousin, Kayla Avery. Any way you look at it, yes. All I can say is I am so impressed with this magistrate. I hope that he is made a U.S. district judge because he certainly has what it takes. Oh, I just want to say one thing, which I have not said tonight. I think every lawyer knows this, but people off the street would never know. Winning this, getting this overturned, having a federal habeas corpus petition win, having success of it, it's about a 99% failure rate. Like you have 1% chance of winning these. That's huge. So, yes, yes. And you think it was the documentary? I think the documentary had something to do with it. You can't tell me that a national documentary like that didn't have something to do with it. I'm not saying that he was swayed by it. I just think it made the judge look deeper into the case. It's a national case. What's next for Dassey? So he may get retried. He may get out, but then if he gets out, what happens to this kid? If he gets out, he has to try to learn to start over. And you know what? I think that he's got a good shot because I think he's got a good bunch of people behind him with this whole Netflix making a murder. I think he's got people behind him that will help him get a job, start, get through some schooling, and Find a skill that he can do. He's not too far gone. He's 26 years old. He is not too jaded yet. I believe that he still can be a good citizen. I think he needs to get out of small town, Mishka. I mean, there's just no way to stay there and live. And I think that was part of Stephen Avery's anger after his exoneration. You can't stay where you've been wronged. I don't know exactly what you mean by he has people backing him up. There's a lot of selectivism in the world where people are very happy to click like or sign a petition by clicking on it. But are they actually willing to throw down a hundred bucks into a college fund for this kid? What are we as a society that we really did, no matter how you look at it, even if you think he was guilty, he was underage and he didn't have a fair trial, period. We owe it to a 16-year-old kid, gave up 10 years of his life. What do we do? The state does give, I mean, you can get money if you've been exonerated, if you've been wrongfully convicted. This is not what is happening here. This is not a case where he is being exonerated or they're saying there's DNA, you've been wrongfully convicted. So unfortunately, those benefits aren't going to be there for him. But he had 
an excellent team behind him, the Center of Wrongful Convictions, and it's a youthful conviction program. I just feel like he has, he's learned, he has some, they don't just li- goodbye, you're gone tomorrow. They build relationships with these people. And it's kind of like what I do with my clients. And I think you've seen, I don't just walk away from people. I try to give them some resources, whether I have them or not to give. But I mean, I try to lead them in the right direction. And I feel like he's not too far biased in his situation. I think he's probably kept a good attitude. He's been moved away from this area to a different prison, so he wasn't around this. And I know what you're saying, because in most cases, you're just let out, given your $10 and bus stop and your bag. And if your family picks you up, that's great. If not, there you are. And what do you do? Where do you go again? And that's when you find yourself back in prison three weeks later because you're selling drugs again. Because what else do you have to do to get your money? You have no money. You have no food. You have, don't know where your, your family's not behind you. So, yeah, that does happen quite often. And that's a, a sad story. And it's a true story. That's why I think it's important that when we look at the big system here and we're looking at Wisconsin and who's in jail and who's in our prisons and why are they there and who's there and what resources do we have that we do something about it and not just turn a blind eye. I don't. I feel very strongly about that. However, I do understand the other side of it and I have a hard time coming to terms with what we actually should do. What I mean by that is somebody actually does commit a crime. They do something wrong. They go to prison. I understand why people might not want them to get help. They might not want them to get any college assistance. They might not want them to get any financial assistance because there are people who didn't go to prison who didn't get those things. And they're probably not going to unless they get somebody special to help them. They're not going to get that. And as a Republican, I mean, I feel strongly that I'm tough on crime as far as if you commit a serious violent crime, you need to serve the time. But I also believe in second chances and therefore you can get out. And if I want people to be able to have the opportunity to have jobs and to work and to have the ability to go to like start out at a community college and earn your way back up and start over. Life isn't over just because you've made a mistake. Because if we all sit down and look at ourselves and look at our family members and look at our neighbors or our even our council members or our or our past three presidents. Right. Or our pastors or anybody. There are people that have all made mistakes and are making mistakes today. And in fact, the heroin epidemic, I think, if anything, shows you the biggest problem that we've had. These are people who, most people who had an injury and were legitimately treated with prescription drugs and can't get off them and had to turn to something that is now illegal. So now all of a sudden they're criminal. As a guy who doesn't have insurance right now, I didn't know that in order to get my prescription refilled, it was going to cost $500 for a doctor's appointment plus the cost of the prescription. Oh, sure. I have a feeling I could go get heroin cheaper than that. You certainly could. I can tell you, my clients will tell you, you certainly could. I'm not going to give you any numbers, Elliot, so let's just move on. But that's crazy. It's crazy. That's a problem. That's crazy. That's kind of off of this topic. No, it's really not, though. It goes back to why people do what they do. And that's why I can't sit and judge anybody for the situation that they're in. Not everybody is the same. We have to give people second chances. We don't know what they're going through at the time. We have to give people second chances because we don't have enough room in prison for them. We don't have money for that. We don't. And quite frankly, our whole focus on how to get people unaddicted isn't putting them in jail without any assistance. We have three prisons that have AODA assistance. And our heroin and drug programs let in very few people. I'm going to tell you that right now. We need to really take a good look at our community and what we're doing for those people. I think at the end of the day, justice was served. How about you? I feel like he shouldn't have been put away. You know, I don't think he should get $40 million or whatever the lawsuit thing that Avery had going on. 
we as a society, we have to do something. There was something that didn't go right there. We have to do something. Fair enough. And I'm still not going to say whether or not what my belief is on who really committed. So we'll save that for another time. Yes, because there's more to come in this case. This case is not over. We both know that. So we'll let that come for another day. Again, please let your children and, I mean, teenagers, let them know that they're, what their rights are. Make sure they know them. And our police officers and our authorities are good people. Majority of them aren't out there to trick your kids or your teenagers. They're out there to protect them and do, do their jobs. But people can get caught up in saying the wrong thing, and all of a sudden they're in a situation like Brandon Dassey, and we don't want that to happen. Know your rights. All right. Those are good closing words. Thank you. Okay. Take care, Elliot. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out the other ones that are available on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, and pretty much everywhere that podcasts are available. If you really liked it, please leave a rating on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, and anywhere else that you can leave a rating. Thanks. Cheers.